Hi, I'm Mary. And I'm Katie, and this is the house I did it. True crime edition. If you like our show, please recommend it to everyone you know. Um, and sub- three single mm-hmm. one. Subscribe to us wherever you listen or watch us, and please give us a five star review so that other people can find us more easily. Um, we do have a real time true crime. So update. Yeah, I started with a little update. Mm-hmm. This is what I had written. Um, that in the, we discussed last week that Riley Strain, a Mizzou student, went missing on March eighth after having been asked to leave a bar in downtown Nashville. He was in Nashville for his Delta Chi spring formal. He told friends he was going back to his hotel, but he wasn't there when they returned and they lost touch with him, so they reported him missing the next day. Police had been searching the Cumberland River after his bank card was found along the river bank. The search then expanded to the Ashland City waterways. And this week, more extensive searches began taking place downtown after footage was released from various surveillance cameras in the area and body cam footage of Riley speaking with a police officer. Um, Luke Bryan, who owned the bar that Riley was removed from on the 8th, made a statement praying for his safe return. The security guards were found to have done everything correct in the situation, leading him down the stairs of the bar and seeing him safely outside. And the bar is not being held responsible for over-serving. So that was my update before today, because this morning Riley's body was recovered from the Cumberland River. Police are saying there are no signs of foul play on his body. He is still fully dressed. He has all of his belongings other than that credit card um they believe that he fell in while walking along the riverbank and people point out that in the videos of him walking downtown he is pretty clearly having trouble walking um a co-worker and I were talking today about like is this the difference between going out with your guy friends and going out with your girlfriends that if one of my friends couldn't walk and said they were going to walk back to my hotel I would never let them walk alone. But then we also, like, they're all, like, 22 years old. They were all drinking. It was their third bar of the night. And, like, once they got back and found that he was missing, they did do everything right. Um, But it's just very unfortunate that he made it that far alone. Um, I just think about... Sorry, a crossover, but on Vanderpump Rules, when Lala said, I think that's just how guys are, and Ariana said, well, that sucks for guys. And that's just how I think. Yeah. About, like, I understand, like, women do it for, like, different reasons. Yeah. But, like, again, not at all to, like, blame his friends, but, like, it is, like, such, it is always in these stories like so unfathomable for women Mm -hmm. to be like literally how does your friend get kicked out of the bar and you do not follow them like I have been quite drunk from about three bars on Broadway in Nashville uh and like we had a group of like six people and not a single separation not even like split in half Mm -hmm. like it I cannot even imagine yeah even like Um, I've mentioned before that I went to, like, a small private college, and even in that setting, there was never... Walking from, like, dorm to dorm, y'all didn't even go alone. Yes, there was, yeah, there was never a time where I walked to my dorm or to my apartment alone, and, like, I, like, literally in the, in the back of our, in the back of the campus, there are two apartment buildings that are the exact same right next to each other and like there's no way my friends would have let me walk from one to the other alone Mm -hmm. um and and so I was saying like I can't imagine letting my friend leave and somebody said well you're not a boy Mm -hmm. like it doesn't it just doesn't cross their minds and Yeah. yeah it's it's 
unfortunate. But I think, like, I guess comforting in some way that he wasn't, like, harmed by someone. Mm -hmm. Um, But very, like, devastating. Um, So, now, let's get into my story. Um, my, My content warning for the day is for sexual assault, harm to children, and um, suicide. So, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. In June of 2002, in West Columbia, South Carolina, 15-year-old Kara Robinson was out in the front yard of her best friend's house helping her to water some plants and shrubs when a strange man, about 30 years old, clean cut and white, approached her. He, she had actually noticed his car leaving the neighborhood before because it was a car she liked. So she thought it was odd when it pulled back into the neighborhood and into her friend's driveway. He began by asking if her parents were home and if he could sell them some magazines. She told him that this was actually not her house. And he asked if her friend's parents were home. When she said they weren't, he handed her the magazines with his left hand and put a small pistol to her neck with his right hand and demanded she come with him. He told her if she screamed, he would shoot her, and he forced her into his Pontiac Trans Am. Kara was shocked that in a residential neighborhood in broad daylight, no one could see this happen. But it's it was June in the middle of the day, so she was like, I guess everyone was at work, and I just didn't notice because I wasn't at school. Um, and it's like one of those things that people just get lucky sometimes. Yeah. That no one saw the one to two minutes that it took. Right. You know? And in the um in the Lifetime movie about this, which it's a Lifetime movie, but Kara is one of the producers of the Lifetime movie about it. Um her friend was like taking a shower so like basically her friend was like i need to water the plants and kara and she's like but i also need to shower and kara was like you shower and i'll water the plants and so like she couldn't see what was happening either um when they got to the car she noticed that a plastic storage container took up the entire back seat so she asked the man where do you want me to go and he told her to get inside the container even say, in good question girlfriend she's like yeah. no shit junkie as fuck where do you want me to sit yeah. <laughs> even in this unthinkable situation kara had the wherewithal to memorize the serial number on the sticker inside the bin blind to her surroundings kara tried to soak up every detail she could like a sponge She took note of the fact that her abductor was listening to a classic rock radio station and was smoking Marlboro Red cigarettes. She counted the turns they took until she could feel them merge onto the interstate. She was keeping her body down in the container, but she could still see through the hatchback of the car. So she was like laying on her back, but she could see through like the back windshield. So there wasn't like a lid on it? Not at this point in time. Um, And she could see as they pulled over into a wooded area. At this stop, the kidnapper tied Kara's hands and feet, gagged her, and this time put the lid on the container. Even through this, Kara remained calm because she knew he wanted her fear and she refused to give him the satisfaction. She was driven. She said that. She said, I knew he wanted my fear and I would not give it to him. I said, yes, bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she was driven 20 more minutes to her abductor's apartment where she was pulled out of the car and dragged across concrete and over a threshold. She felt helpless as she heard the sounds of cars and people around her, knowing that no one knew she was there. Once inside the apartment, she was released from the storage container and told not to do anything foolish. She was led into his bedroom and ordered to undress and shower. While in the residence, Kara's survival instincts kicked in. She continued to take mental note of the details of her captor's life. He had a guinea pig, lizard, birds, fish, hamsters, and several other small animals. Kara called it an entertainment center full of cages. Why do you have so many? Yeah. 
She memorized the name of the doctor and dentist he had cards for on his refrigerator. She found a plethora of women's toiletries in the bathroom, as well as long red hairs, which caused her to believe this man did not live alone. Mm -hmm. This theory was later confirmed when Kara's captor told her he needed to make a phone call to his wife. He put Kara back into the container, this time on his bed, gagged and tied her again, and put the lid back on, telling her to keep quiet so that his wife wouldn't find out about her. After about 30 minutes, Kara could not stop crying hysterically. The man came back into the room and asked her why she was making so much noise. She told him she could not breathe, so he agreed to leave the gag out and the lid off if she promised not to scream or make noise. While Kara was in the apartment, she was sexually assaulted on and off for six hours and forced to smoke marijuana. Kara explained that he asked her before each thing he did, but it was always coupled with the reminder that he had a gun. She obviously felt like there was no option to say no due to the threat of punishment, pain, or murder. She also said that at 15 years old, the things he asked her to do were shocking to her, things she had never done or even heard of. He used sadomasochistic equipment and what Kara called adult paraphernalia on her, which I think is, like, such a reminder of how, like, young and innocent she was. Like, 15, like, when I was 15, I, I would have called anything sexual, like, adult paraphernalia, too, like, she genuinely adult had no movies, idea. You say adult, yeah. like you know, like yeah. Yeah, she genuinely had no idea what some of these things things were. Just that, like, they were for grown ups. Yeah. Um. He asked her several questions about herself and used a pen and notepad to write down every answer. How old are you? Where do you live? Do you have a boyfriend? Are you a virgin? Whose house were you at? He gave her rules for while she was at his home and a list of things she could and could not say to him. Kara felt that her best option for staying alive was letting him be in control, and he seemed to really buy into this. He began to tell Kara he liked that she was so calm. He seemed comfortable with her in the fact that she was non-threatening, even specifically telling her that she didn't seem upset at having to be there. He's, like, starting to, like, believe that she wants to be there. She said, yeah, I'm having a great time. Yeah. He said, you don't seem upset Obviously. at all. And she's like, me? Upset? Thank For you. For what? For bringing me here. Yeah, I love it. I love your I was miserable animal. watering the shrubs. Yeah. They weren't Can even I my shrubs. play with all of your pets? Then I'm happy <laughs> to stay. Like, and do we take the hamsters out? Does the lizard like to go outside? I In love to go outside. Yard. <laughs> um. Eventually, the kidnapper told Kara it was time to eat. Kara told him she wasn't hungry and asked if there was anything she could do for him. Dang, I was about to keep the joke going and go, I love to eat. <laughs> and then she said, I'm not hungry. <laughs> In the In the movie, um... She says, oh, I I totally understand that it's time to eat, but I don't want to. <laughs> like, that's how she says it is like, like, she's like trying to like not be argumentative. Like, she's like, oh, my gosh, like, of course, it's time to eat. I just it will not be doing that. Um, um, but I actually though, like you. weird, quirky thing about me. I love watching people eat, though. Yeah, so I'd be thrilled to uh, sit with you while you eat. Yeah. So, but yeah, so she was like, I'm not hungry, but is there anything I can do for you? And as a result, she ended up sweeping his kitchen for him. Nice. He was like, that's fine. You don't have to eat. Sweep my kitchen. I love to sweep kitchens. Yes, it's my favorite. <laughs> Um, while watching the evening news, Kara and her captor saw a news report on her disappearance. Then he gave her a Valium to make her sleep and bound her to his bed. They said, like, with her legs spread, but then I think only one of her ankles was bound to the bed, so I'm not totally sure. Um, but at dawn, after 18 hours, 
Kara suddenly woke up and was hit with the reality that it was now or never for her escape. As her captor slept, still dosed with marijuana and Valium, Kara managed to undo her restraints. She had been handcuffed to the bed frame using a circular clamp tightened by a screw and connected to a rope. She managed to use her teeth to free one of her hands and then unclipped her leg from a leather restraint that was attached to the end of the bed. She made her way to the living room where she found her clothes and shoes and got dressed. She tiptoed to the front door and unbolted the two locks, finally fleeing the apartment. In all, she said it took about one minute to do all of that. But, like, can you imagine, like, how long that minute feels? Mm -hmm. She flagged down a passing car, told them she had been kidnapped and raped, and had the two men inside drive her. Naked? Like, when tied to the bed? Do we know? So, in the um, movie, and again, it's a Lifetime movie, so, like, I don't know if this is just for the sake of, like, this is a 15-year-old girl, but in the movie, she was wearing his shirt. Okay. He had, made her put his clothes on instead. It was just... I was thinking of, like, the toy box killer, and I was like, you know, like, is that the big red flag that this naked 15-year-old girl is running down the street? Um, but, yeah, I guess who knows. She, she did, she got her clothes back on, though. Oh, okay. So, she got out of bed, and she found her clothes and shoes in the living room, and she got dressed as she was leaving. Okay. Um... She had the two men inside the car drive her to the police station. She provided the police with as much information as she could, and they were able to track back to his apartment complex. They called Kara's mom to let her know that she had been found, and she rushed to the police station in hysterics before police drove Kara back to the complex. I just cannot imagine committing, like, the fetal abduction ones you did. Like, I cannot imagine committing these crimes in an apartment Mm -hmm. (laughs) unfortunately Kara could not remember the exact apartment number but as they were searching the complex for anything familiar Kara flagged down a maintenance worker she gave the man a description of her kidnapper and the inside of his apartment and he was able to identify the apartment number and confirm the man's identity his name was Richard Ivonitz the police were completely impressed with Kara They said when she arrived, they thought, look at this precious young girl and what has happened to her. There's a fucking another one. Another precious young girl. Um, But they soon realized just how intelligent, strong, and determined she was and how that had helped her escape. Once investigators arrived at the apartment, Ivonitz had already fled. Inside the apartment, they found a lost footlock. I know. That marijuana and melium was, like, working, and then all of a sudden it just yeah. wasn't. <laughs> they found a locked footlocker filled with newspaper clippings and meticulous notes on the habits and movements of young girls. Kara was not one of the girls he had been researching, but police actually believe he was targeting the friend whose home she had been staying at for those few days based on his notes. While Kara was in captivity, her abductor had told her several times that he would let her go in the end, but once she learned about the other girls, she knew that wasn't true and that she's the only reason she made it out alive. As it would turn out, Ivonitz was not only Kara's kidnapper, but also a serial killer. The newspaper clippings covered the unsolved murders of three girls, Sophia Silva, Katie Lisk, and Christy Lisk. All three girls had gone missing from Spotsylvania County, Virginia, over five years before Kara was taken. Sophia Silva was 16 years old when she seemingly vanished from her front porch in Loreala Park on September 9, 1996. She had just returned from school and was working on her homework outside in the approximately 80-degree weather Police believe Ivanitz approached Sophia with the same ruse as he did with Kara, offering her magazines to buy before forcing her into his car and driving her to his home where she was bound, raped, and asphyxiated. There was no sign of struggle or witnesses at her house. 
Sophia's decomposed body was found a month later in Birchwood Creek off of State Route 3 in King George County. She had been wrapped in a white cover and her pubic hair had been shaved off. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Sophia Marlene Silva was born on July 1st, 1980 in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Once they found out that this was who had killed her, her family thanked investigators, friends, neighbors, and especially Kara for helping search for Sophia and eventually finding her killer and for offering condolences and prayers. They agreed that although their pain will continue, there is comfort in knowing that the man who took Sophia from them is now known. On May 1st, 1997, 15-year-old Christy Lisk and her 12-year-old sister Katie were taken from their own home on Blockhouse Road in Hanover, Virginia. They had been seen getting off their school buses, but when their father came home expecting to find them on the front lawn, there was no sign of the girls other than Christy's backpack. Notes about Christy and Katie had been found in Ivanitz's Navy footlocker. It is believed that once he approached them, he bound them and put them into the trunk of his car, where Christy tried to push the door back open with her hands, but was unable. Investigators believe he took them home and locked Katie in the bathroom while he attempted to rape Christy, but was unable to perform, so he drowned both girls in the bathtub. Their bodies were found five days later in the South Anna River, about 35 miles from his home, with both girls showing signs of sexual assault and strangulation. So did he assault them post-mortem? I don't know. So I got these pieces of information from two different sources. Why in the hell would straight, like, drowning them in the bathtub be your, like, method? I, I, I don't, that does not we sound simple. We are going to get to something that I think might explain that. Um, but that's like very not easy. Yeah. Right? To drown someone? In a bathtub, two of them? Well, but I also wonder if like he strangled them in the bathtub because mm. there were signs of, signs of strangulation. Um, I think it was like a mix of those things. Just yeah, did he think like the bathtub, like the water would like help with like evidence? I don't know. Kristen Michelle Lisk was born on January first, nineteen eighty-two, in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, she shares a grave with her sister Catherine Nicole Lisk, who was born on October twelfth, nineteen eighty-four, in Fredericksburg. Under Kristen's tell. name. What is that? Oh, what is that? It's the parent trap girl's birthday. Oh. Um, under or Kristen's October name. October 11th? I don't know. I was born on October 11th. Yeah, they were turning 12. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> under Katie's name on their tombstones, I just find this like, I don't know, it just hit me hard for some reason, um, is a Bible verse that reads, if possible, so far as it all depends on you, be at peace with all men. Mm -hmm. That feels, but that feels. Except oh. one. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be at peace with him, sis. <laughs> um, in the same interview as Sophia Silva's family, Christy and Katie's father, Ron Lisk, said, quote, Patty and I were robbed of our children, and all of you in our community were robbed of your trust in our fellow man. Please hang on tight to your children. Tell them you love them every day. Treasure each moment with them. Give them a hug every day, end quote. Yeah. The investigation into these three unsolved murders went cold until Kara made her way to police. They learned that her captor was named Richard Ivonitz, and they ultimately took forensic evidence from his home and the trunk of his car, which would later be matched to the scene where Sophia was discovered, as well as the Lisk sisters. They matched fibers from the furry handcuffs that he used on Kara and his handprints. 
They also found girls' underwear, nude photos, and pornographic pictures and videos on his computer, as well as a video of Ivanitz himself molesting a young girl and another of him masturbating to Polaroid photos of children. I, again, I say it every time. Stop taking evidence of yourself committing crimes. I swear. I don't understand. Police tracked him down to Sarasota, Florida, and on June 27, 2002, a high-speed chase ensued. Ivanitz had called his sister Jennifer and told her that he had committed more crimes than he can remember, and oh. she called to turn him in to Florida authorities. Thank you, ma'am. He was captured when he ran over spike strips on the highway and was attacked by a police dog. Then, at 10.52 p.m., he shot himself in the head and died instantly. When Kara was notified of Ivanitz's death, she initially felt cheated. She said she wanted the chance to walk into a courtroom with her head held high. She wanted him to have to look her in the eye and realize she was, quote, the biggest mistake he ever made. Eventually, though, she came to realize that she ultimately did not want to be re-traumatized in court. When Sophia Silva's family learned of Ivanitz's role in her murder and his subsequent death, her sister Pam said, quote, our family feels he is facing a much harsher punishment than he ever would have on earth, end quote. Mm -hmm. They said, we do not believe in this justice system. <laughs> they said, fuck that. Yeah. Um, Richard Mark Edward Ivanitz was born on July 29, 1963 in Columbia, South Carolina at Providence Hospital to his parents, Joseph and Tess Ivanitz. That extra name, always a sign of a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Mamas don't let your babies have four names. Mm -hmm. he or was go only... by all three of their names. He only He actually only went by one of his middle names. Um, he was the only boy of their three children with two younger sisters. Kristen was born in July of 1968 and Jennifer in March of 1971. Mark's parents separated when he was a baby, but then got back together before separating again when he was 12 years old. They officially divorced in 1985. It was reported that Joseph Ivanitz was an alcoholic who frequently passed out after drinking and belittled his family, calling them names like morons and peons. I don't even know what that means. It's basically the same thing. Doesn't cool. Matter. Mark's two future wives, Bonnie Lou Gower and Hope Marie Crowley, would later claim that he had nightmares about his father, specifically about a time when he drowned their family dog in front of them and then tried to drown Mark himself when he was only six. Mark's sister Jennifer claimed, quote, we lived in a prison. Joe was a very controlling person. He wanted us to make straight A's. If we didn't, we were stupid. It was all about power and control. You'll get an A or you'll get a beating. I see him as a sadistic man. I know I saw the pleasure in his face out of making us miserable, end quote. Despite this dysfunctional family dynamic and living with a verbally and physically abusive father, Mark graduated from Irmo County High School in 1980 at the age of 16 mm. and quickly became a store manager of a Jiffy Lube. As a teenager, though, Mark began breaking and entering into his neighbor's houses, stealing valuables that he would use to pay for weed and alcohol. At this, his father gave him an ultimatum. Mark could either go to jail or go into the service. Does his father realize he does not have the authority to put his son in right. jail? Right. Like, I was like, is it up to you? Um, I am the law. But I guess when you're 16 and you said, oh, not shit. Anymore, he's like, I don't oh, know. Um, so Mark joined the Navy <clears throat> and served as a sonar technician and received a good conduct medal before being honorably discharged after eight years of service. It seems that he was embracing his new straight-laced life, 
But in 1987, Mark Ivonitz was arrested in Jacksonville, Florida, and was sentenced to three years probation. He had pulled his car up to two girls in a residential neighborhood and exposed himself to 15-year-old Kelly Ballard and her three-year-old sister, and then masturbated in front of them. The next day, Kelly saw him again following her and her mother in a mall parking lot, and they wrote down his license plate number and took it to police. At the time of his sentencing, Mark told police that he had a problem with masturbating in front of girls. I, and it I was would clear say that is a problem, yeah. Just in general. It was clear that he could see the disparity between himself and young girls, viewing them as powerless and easily controlled. In fact, in the late 1980s, Mark began dating the 14-year-old friend of his sister, Bonnie. At 25 years old, oh, 25. At 25 years old, he married her. But by the time of their honeymoon, his new wife realized she had gotten herself into more than she had bargained for. She realized there are other, she was 25. <laughs> she's 14. There were some reports that she was 16. Either way. It not does good. not matter to me. Um, during their courtship, Mark seemed sweet. But on their honeymoon, he introduced her to his interest in rough sex and bondage. In their sexual life, Mark would leave Bonnie tied up for hours on end, taking breaks before coming back to rape her again. At the time, young Bonnie didn't realize she could say no to her husband, which is likely what Mark had hoped for by marrying a child. Their neighbors viewed them as an average young couple. They How attended young does he look? I swear. They attended neighborhood cookouts and made friends easily. However, once Bonnie was in her early 20s, Mark was no longer interested and wanted a young girl again. After 11 years of marriage, Bonnie had actually met someone online and began a virtual long distance relationship. He taught her that her husband's sexual desires were not normal and that she deserved better. And she left Mark and moved to California to be with this new man. Good for Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Yes, queen. I hope he does not turn out to be sketchy, but yeah. Mm -hmm. After his divorce in 1996, Mark had to file for bankruptcy, and three years later, his house was foreclosed. Free from the shackles of marriage, Mark was on the prowl for someone new. Around the time Bonnie left him, he broke into a Spotsylvania home where two girls were home alone. He locked the younger of the two girls in the bathroom and raped the older one before leaving the home with the two girls still alive. So he left them there. So these are the early days of his. Is it their own? Like it was their home? I'm missing. Yes. Okay. okay. He broke into their house and then he raped one of them and then he left. Okay. Mark met his next wife at a pancake house where 17-year-old Hope was a waitress. They started dating, and once it got serious, they got married. Like Look, Bonnie, I'm not, like, trying to say he should, like, marry 12-year-olds, but I guess I'm, like, not following the logic that, like, you get in in marriages knowing that, like, they will continue to age. Right. And so, especially marrying one that is, like, 17, like, on the cusp of adulthood. Right. Uh, it seems like it might defeat the purpose. Yeah. Um, like Bonnie, Hope went into the marriage naive to what her husband's true intentions were. By this time, Mark had begun to take Viagra, so he was able to keep Hope tied up for even longer as he raped her. Hope was out of town when Mark abducted Kara, and this is the red-haired woman he called while Kara was laying inside the storage container. Oh, no. At was one she point, still, like young at that point. So they, they they got married, I think, in 1997, mm -hmm. and they were married until he died in 2002. Okay. So she was still young, but not as young. Twenties. Okay. Yeah. Um. At one point in the 1990s, this is like super random, but I was like, I have to say this because it's interesting to me. 
He had a letter published in the Freelance Star, the principal daily newspaper of Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Virginia, titled Bigotry Against Gays Betrays Nation's Ideals. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pop off for, for right now. For oh, one second. Um, <laughs> after this, he became a salesman and sold compressors and grinding equipment. From 1999 to 2002, he worked at an air compressor company where it is reported his female co-workers avoided him because he had a misogynistic attitude and anger management issues. I'd say so. Mm-hmm. I can, I can see that. Even though Ivanitz died by suicide, the Spotsylvania County Sheriff, Ronald Knight, announced that Ivanitz was officially found responsible for the three unsolved murders. Kara was given $150,000 in reward money for helping solve the murders, which she used to pay her bills and tuition throughout college. Nice. After meeting their families, the girls' families, Kara said, quote, it is one of the most important things that's ever happened to me because it brought home the importance of what I did because I felt like, wow, I'm actually giving these families something that they never would have gotten without me. Just the closure of knowing that the person responsible for their daughter's deaths is no longer here, end quote. Mm -hmm. Richard Ivonitz is now a suspect in a 1994 abduction and a 1995 rape, also in Spotsylvania, Virginia, as well as the murders of Sarah Cherry, Alicia Showalter Reynolds, and Anne Carolyn McDaniel. Wow. On July 6th, 1988, 12-year-old Sarah Margaret Cherry was taken during her first babysitting gig in Bowden, Maine. Her body was found several days later, hidden in a wooded area. She had been bound with rope, tortured, sexually assaulted with birch sticks, stabbed, and then strangled with a scarf. About a year later, Dennis DeShane was convicted for Sarah's murder after an estimate with his name on it was found in Sarah's driveway. And the rope and scarf found with her body were found to have come from his truck. Oof. It, don't, it sounds like, like he did it. Yeah. Um, however, many believe DeShane is innocent, as there was actually no forensic evidence leaking, linking Sarah to DeShane's pickup truck itself. She was never in the truck despite it having been found about 450 feet away from her body. The truck? He, yeah. He claims that somebody must have taken those things from his truck because it was so close. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, look, I'm just, I'm just putting the facts in here, but I don't think he's innocent. Mm -hmm. He has filed several appeals and maintains that he is innocent. Ivanitz has been linked to Sarah's murder due to the fact that he was working as a sonar technician aboard the USS Kolsch in Portland, Maine from May of 1988 to May of 1989. Deirdre Enright, founder of the University of Virginia Law School's Innocence Project, <coughs> noted a link between Sarah's murder and Ivanitz's MO, as well as the fact that his vehicle at the time matched the description of a white Toyota Corolla spotted near where Sarah's body was found. Oh, yeah, that's more evidence than the other guy. Yeah. Ivonitz was known to frequent the Brunswick Naval Air Station Commissary only 13 miles south of Bowden. What about 450 feet? Right. Police have been unable to link DNA from Sarah's case to Ivanitz due to being deemed insufficient, and Dennis DeShane remains incarcerated for Sarah Cherry's murder because he did it. Um, the other Let's two are, I mean, he was convicted of it, so I can say he did it. Yeah. Um, and there's no repercussions. <laughs> um, the other two, though. On March 2nd, 1996, at 7.30 a.m., 25-year-old Alicia Showalter Reynolds left her home in Baltimore, Maryland, and made her way to Charlottesville, Virginia. 25? Around, I know. This is the only thing that I'm like, hmm. Um, at around 6 p.m. that evening, Alicia's car was found abandoned off of the highway near Culpeper, Virginia. 
Witnesses later came forward to tell police they had seen Alicia along the side of Route 29 speaking to a man in a blue pickup truck. On May 7th, Alicia's body was found in a wooded area 15 miles to the southwest of where she had last been seen. Police were unable to determine her exact cause of death, but did rule it a homicide. On September 22nd, 1996, a small group of local men exercising with their dogs came across the remains of a woman just 10 miles from where Alicia's body had been found. This woman was later determined to be 20-year-old Anne Carolyn McDaniel, who had cerebral palsy. Anne had last been seen leaving the group home she was living in for adults with mental and physical disabilities in the town of Orange. On September 18th, Witnesses claimed to have seen Anne attempting to hitchhike along Route 29. Alicia's and Anne's murders were credited to the Route 29 stalker, which authorities now believe could be Ivanitz after finding what appeared to be scribbled directions to the site of Alicia's body in one of the footlockers in his apartment. So do you think that he did these two? Um... I think it's possible. I don't know. Um, I think so too. And I do. I, I, I do say like with Sarah Cherry, like the being left in the woods, and like yeah, a lot of it does feel similar. I just don't think that it's more than what they have against Dennis Deshane. Yeah, and did you say her name was Anne? The mm-hmm. like um the what? The third that you just listed. Oh yeah. Um, my thought, so, like, obviously my first thought was, like, 25 and 20 is, like, not, Mm -hmm. doesn't seem right to me. Mm -hmm. Um, however, like, you add a disability in there. Right. And I think, like, the vulnerability level. Right. The ability to overpower. Right. Gets similar, um, possibly even, like, a mental childlikeness. Mm-hmm. Um, would be similar, but yeah, Alicia being like 25 and like seemingly developmentally 25. Yeah, and uh, I will say like strange, but I yeah, mean, Alicia like she doesn't even like she looks 25. Like yeah, I like I don't think there was any like mistaking that she was an adult or anything. Yeah. I so I don't know. That's the only thing that like leaves me hesitant. But then I'm mm-hmm. like he had notes about them. Yeah. Cause I was gonna say, like, you could certainly have notes about like her murder and like it on the news and stuff, and like mm-hmm. that just means you're like interested in murders. Yeah. But notes to the mm-hmm. place her body was like right. seems strange and i wonder um if like if it was some kind of like crime of opportunity sure um i don't know and then it and is this like before the the proven ones I was just thinking about that. So these were both in 1996, um, as was Sophia Silva. But Alicia Reynolds was in March of 1996, Sophia Silva on September 9th of 1996, and on September 22nd of 1996. And then Katie and Christy in 1997. And then Kara in 2002. There's more in between there for sure. Yeah, there's, they're that close together. And then yeah, 1997 and 2002. Unless, yeah, I mean. Because that's around the time he got married to Hope. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I was going to say, like, if Alicia was the first. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe he did it and then he was like I don't like yeah this with adults and so then he found and then I was thinking maybe he found Anne who was like kind of next best 
thing mm-hmm. in like a really gross way, but then possibly he found Silva, mm-hmm. right? Silva. Sophia. Sophia. Silva's the last name. Sophia Silva, yeah. So so possibly he found Sophia said, nope, this is what I like. Mm-hmm. And then he still could have found Anne and said like. Especially if she will, was hitchhiking. Yeah, this will do. Right. Um, and then he like is like honing. Yeah. You know. And after, which we don't know how he found Sophia, or Sophia was on her porch. Yeah. Okay, so, like, I don't know, yeah. Sophia, Christy, Katie, and Kara were all, like, out in the front. Do we know Sophia's home's proximity to this, like, Highway 29? So, um, not, like, proximity yeah. but they were all in virginia okay um mm-hmm. yeah so over time kara robinson formed a strong relationship with the police especially those who took on her case she graduated from the south carolina criminal justice academy and then worked as a school resource officer sex crime and child abuse investigator and a victim's advocate Once she got married and had her two boys, she left the front lines of the police force, but continues to work with law enforcement as a public speaker. In 2019, Kara was interviewed by Elizabeth Smart, along with five other abduction survivors in a lifetime special called Smart Justice, the Jamie Kloss case, where Kara and the other survivors offered support to Jamie, who had recently escaped 88 days in captivity. On this subject, Kara said, quote, I sat down on a couch with Elizabeth and five other women who had survived kidnappings and sexual assaults, and that was the moment that I realized I had a bigger purpose. I knew that I could find a reason for what happened, and I always knew that what happened to me was something that happened so that I could help other people. I was healed on that couch, sitting there talking to these women in a way that I didn't even realize I was hurting, just to sit down and talk to women who really understood the heart of what I had been through. End quote. And I want to finish with an excerpt from Kara's blog, which reads, quote, through the years, Kara realized that she survived for a very specific purpose, to spread hope and encouragement to other survivors, to remind them that they are not alone, that they can heal, and that they are stronger than what happened to them, that we are who we are because of what happened, but we are not defined by it. End quote. Sweet. I love her. You are right. She's, I should not do JC Dugard next. <laughs> yeah. Um, she she's awesome. Yeah. Very, very impressive. Mm-hmm. And like I when the first time I watched her the Lifetime movie, the like it was all happening so fast, like the her escape and getting the police and then coming back to the apartment that I was like, are they gonna not believe her? Mm-hmm. Like he is so, doing so fucking well. Um, but that luckily is not what happened. They believed her from the jump and thankfully we're truly just so impressed by her and like, um, her, like her first like police picture, like you can just tell that like she took what she had been through and like, not like made it her life, but like made it like her purpose for things and like that she truly like wanted to be like the people who saved her yeah um and yeah she's she's just so cool yeah I yeah on the one hand I'm like there are definitely more Uh but I think I do struggle with like someone like that and maybe maybe they did have lots of others but like I feel like he would have news clippings and like information on mm-hmm. every one. So right. and he had like, like, like underwear. Yeah, it feels like they should have been able to connect more. Like, oh, he yeah. has this, so he must have done this one. But yeah. maybe there was, and it just like wasn't yeah. enough. I don't know. But I don't know. Or they're, like, ones that didn't really get news coverage. Um, yeah, maybe. Or maybe he was, like, not proud of them because they were, or he didn't want to, like, reminisce on them because they were grown-ups or something. Or they didn't go well or. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, like, like. Couldn't perform. Like, 
Jeffrey Dahmer, there's, like, one person that he killed that he, like, refused to keep any of their body parts because he didn't like how it went. Mm -hmm. Um, so, like, maybe something like that. I don't know. I don't pretend to understand these people. No. Um, but, yeah. I just, I, like, I was watching a TikTok the other day, and, um, a woman was complaining because Crime Junkie had covered her sister's case, and she was, like, talking about how they basically, like, they would not have money if people weren't murdered and, like, all this stuff. And I was thinking, like, I think that that's maybe why I love, like, survivor stories so much is, like, I love getting to hear Kara tell this story. Yeah. And, like, hear it from her and feel like like she wants people to, like... Yeah learn from it and like in, in there are several cases that like I was like I like I don't know you see family members doing interviews and like wanting to spread the word and get things solved and like fix things so like I think that you just have to like tread lightly with knowing what the family wants and doesn't want but like I feel like when I do like a survivor story that there is like no like gray area like is this okay to tell for entertainment purposes? Like, because it feels like they they want, like, again, like Kara saying, like, her purpose to, like, help other people and things like that. Um, and it just is very uplifting. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, like, always, like, danger, I guess, mm-hmm. in just this world of, like, doing cases like this. And, like, obviously, it does sound like in this case, like, the families, the other families of Yvonne victims Mm -hmm. are, like, grateful for Kara. Yeah. Um, But, like, there is also a world where, like, this is a survival survival story that had people that didn't survive. Yeah. And essentially, like, people could, families could be mad that they're, their loved ones stories being overshadowed by Kara's and like you know like there could always be like something and I think I don't know it's like hard you want to do this like as ethically as possible but also Mm -hmm. like a lot of true crime is like awareness and the whole time you were talking I was thinking like I have always said like my kid will literally never be in my front yard yeah like I literally in the um in the lifetime movie Kara like really struggles with that like with her mom suddenly not wanting her to go to her boyfriend's house not wanting her to go to a baseball game and she's like before 2 days ago I could do whatever I wanted and like had I not been kidnapped I could still do whatever I wanted like right. it just it's cuz this one thing like like this one crazy thing happened that we never would have expected to happen and I'm like as a teenager fair I get I get it but like yeah I can't um also the um quiet on set solidified my kids never being on social media that we, because we talked about that when I was in Minnesota. So if you're oh, my like family, you posting them. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. If you are a family member of mine, I'm so sorry, but when I have babies, you will not post pictures of them anywhere. You will not. You will not. Ever. You will not. Mm-mm. You can put an emoji on their face. Yeah. I'll show you how to do it. Yeah. You send send me the picture, and I'll put the emoji and send it back to you if you don't know how. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, which is unfortunate because I like I do like I love seeing my friends like pictures of their babies and like my family's pictures of their babies and like to each their own. Well, but, share the album it up. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, could not yeah. be me. 
I'll keep posting yeah. my dog. Yeah. Whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Thanks for listening. Yeah, everyone. See you later. See ya. And go to our YouTube. Yes. We have a bonus episode this week. A haunting. A little different. For us. Okay. So, go watch that on YouTube. Bye. Bye.